disclosure as a powerful JVM language from a value-added perspective, and uh, for basically for those who know Java, and uh, for, you know, colloquially, uh, okay, I know Java, why should I consider uh, closure? And we'll see how it goes. So first, a little bit about me. My name is Avram Melanie. Uh, I have sort of like a, a different path that I've taken to, to get to where I am today. Uh, I have a master's in public health in uh, epidemiology and biostatistics, and along the way I've needed to do practical things. And practical things require programming, and eventually, you know, I think we'll all need to program regardless of our domain. Um, but I've had certainly a programming language evolution, which has taken me from statistical programming languages, first SAS, through the evolution of, you know, we need to prepare this data, and we need some scripting languages, we need some Unix skills, some batch scripting skills, so I uh, learned Perl very early on, and that, uh, the, the staff sort of moved into R, and R is a very, very popular statistical programming language today, but there are some limitations, and you get into some large data sets that don't fit into memory, you need to sample, and so uh, I sort of got into Clojure as a way to, um, to help me bridge that gap, and to uh, take advantage of a lot of things that, that, that JVM offers in terms of uh, libraries and, and scaling. Uh, it'd be nice if you could do your analysis and um, you know you could just hand it off and it would work in a production environment source. So um, you can notes on evangelism. You know, I don't want to seem like there's only one way to do something, and uh, you know, there's a lot of different languages on the JVM, but just one of them. And uh, you know, I like Shakira says, whenever, wherever, if you feel that Java fits what you want to do and you know that well, that's fine. And uh, I don't think there's anybody in the Clojure community that says, you know, you must use Clojure, but I think that you'll find there's some attractive features. A few disclaimers. Um, there are a lot of really, really intelligent people that know a lot about Clojure and far more than I do. Uh, I am standing on their shoulders and I've sort of synthesized a lot of the material for this talk based on things that they've put out. And I really recommend uh, going through a lot of the literature in terms of blog posts, books, and things like this. It's also a huge topic. I've tried to hit like the, the grand tour. And uh, the good news is, is that you know, if you're still unconvinced that you shouldn't try closure, there's probably a lot of better talks out there than mine. <laughs> but at least you'll have this as well. So, all right. So just a quick audience survey. Uh, I assume that most of you have some experience with Java, but can we just like go around the room? Mm -hmm. How many people have, I don't know, two years of job experience or more? Okay, how about five years of job experience? Okay, that's great. So, and has anybody tried closure? <laughs> okay, any other uh, functional language? Okay, and any other JVM language, like Scala, for example? Groovy. Groovy. Okay. Okay, so I think that's about a fit for what I've sort of planned for, but uh, if, if anything seems to be you know too opaque, I'll do my best to explain. So using Clojure is a lot about utility. Um, why why is Clojure useful if you already know Java? Well, there's there's some some goals about the way that the, the language is, was uh, designed, and among them were to provide simplicity and some concision, make things concise, and really allow. Um, the freedom to focus on the problem domain. So if you're working on solving X, you shouldn't have to go too far afield from the language of X in order to, uh, to address that problem. If it's a, a business problem uh, about an enterprise, and you're, you're, you should be able to speak in, in, the, in the language of, of the, the problem you're trying to solve. And a lot of that uh, involves, um, uh, well, let, me, let me say that there's also a practical approach as well. So we are on the JVM. There's some, some limitations to make things easier just to get things done. And there's also that component of closure. Okay. And the grant, this is going to be the grand tour. Uh, the idea is that there's actually a published rationale that uh, Rich Hickey, the creator of Closure, has put out. And we'll go into that, and that will sort of guide us along our way. And this is mostly about the why you should you know, consider closure rather than the how, because the how is such a, a vast topic. OK, some similarities and pre preliminaries. Um, this is a, a slide uh, taken from um, uh, a Stu, Stu Holloway. Um, a presentation called uh, <clears throat> A Better Job in Java and uh, Closure Job Interop, but it sort of has a comparison of the topic data types of uh, things that you see in Closure versus things that you see in Java. So you have a string, which is just uh, you know uh, some word within double quotes in, in Closure, that's just a string. Uh, character is uh, a slash, and then the, the character you'd like. 
Um, you also have regular expressions uh, that uh, are natively supported in closure, and it's just a pound sign, and then some something in double quotes, and that you have your your um, regular expression there. They say that you know if you, if you need regular expressions, you start using them. Now you, you had one problem, now you have two problems. Well, there you go. Could you clarify what you mean by atomic data type? Sure. So these are things that the language actually supports. So if you say, if you just uh, say um, double quote foo, mm -hmm. at double quote. Some ratio, could I call method some ratio, or is it so just, I'll, I'll, it's just I'll, a literal type of thing? I'll get, I'll get to that. But yeah, so, so there's, there's really three new things that are um, supported by closure that are not, in, they don't have direct Java equivalents. Mm -hmm. um, we could probably skip over the rest. I mean, there's, there's different kinds of integers, doubles. Booleans are true or false. Uh, then the concept of, of, of nothingness or emptiness in, in lists are, is nil rather than null. Um, but to your point, ratio. So if you'd like, when you divide a numerator by a denominator, uh, it will stay that way. So you don't lose any precision. Um, and it'll carry those around. And there's, a, there's also a concept uh, within the enclosure of, of laziness so that you don't ah. do things until you absolutely need them, which is good for many reasons. Right. Um, so, so you can convert a, a ratio to a, a floating point at some point, but you need not to, and it, it will leave that until it needs to. Um, then you also have symbols, which are just things that need to be looked up. For example, foo or plus. This is something that that you know will be defined, or uh, it'll be uh, definition will be sought after. And there's a concept of a keyword. Keyword is just something prefixed by a colon, and a keyword will always return itself. And it's just like a nice uh, nicety to um, to label data, and we'll see it. It's very useful in maps. And um, and that's all on this slide. A any questions so far? I don't know if I should stop every now and then for okay. So this is the, the rationale I was talking about. It's actually a picture of Rich Hickey, the creative closure. If you see any of his videos, they're actually very very well researched and. Um, well expressed. And he says, I wanted, they asked him, why did you create closure? And he said, I wanted a list for functional programming symbiotic with an established platform designed for concurrency. So let's break that down into four things. Um, so there's this whole concept of what a list is, and we'll, we'll talk about that. And then functional programming is its own huge topic. And then symbiotic with an established platform, this will be the JVM initially, but also other platforms. And uh, design for concurrency and what that really means. So the first part, a list. So what does it mean to be a list? Well, unlike Java, where you need to have everything statically typed, uh, in a list you can just, you know, you have a number and now it's it's there, or or a string and it's there. You don't need to 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 um, to be explicit about it, about your typing. Um, there's also this this idea of like being homoiconic where you have uh, uniformity uh, in, in the syntax. And uh, lists are also known for being expression oriented. There's this uh, whole, whole literature on uh, S expressions, which are symbolic expressions. We'll talk a little bit about that. And um, <clears throat> this lambda calculus uh, from John McCarthy, and that sort of enables uh, some, some logic and, and variable binding, which I, I won't go too deeply into, but I'll mention it. But lists also have things like macros, code that writes code. And um, because it's dynamic, the, this idea of a compile step is blurred, so you can take advantage of that. And, uh, and, and also, um, in this, you can use code as data, and data as code, and I'll talk about what that really means as well. So one of the nice things about Clojure that really attracted me to Clojure is that there's not a lot of ceremony uh, involved with getting to the meat of things. You know, if you want a list, you just write the list. It's like if you want, if you have four numbers, it's just going to be, you know, open friend four numbers. And if you put a, a single quote in front of it, that'll stop it from being evaluated directly, um, and that'll be a list. So um, if you want a vector, kind of the same idea. You use brackets. So you have open bracket, and then whatever is going to be inside is going to be that's a vector. That's just how vectors are annotated. And if it's a list, the insertion will go to the front of it. Uh, if it's a vector, new insertions will go to the back. And if you want a map, you just open a curly brace and you close a curly, curly brace. Now, the thing about maps is they always have key value pairs, so there must be an even uh, count of elements in your map. 
And here again, we see uh, colon A is a keyword. And so the key uh, keyword is actually being used uh, uh, in, in that sense. So, um, and then that's quite useful because it's sort of like self-annotation. We can say, okay, well, I can immediately see that there are four keys and there are four values, and, and those, that's what they are. And then there's another um, uh, primitive uh, data structure in Enclosure uh, called a set. And a set is very closely related to a map. Uh, the, the only difference is that their uh, sets are, have distinct number of elements, so there's no duplicates allowed in a set. And that, that's a really useful uh, uh, feature to have uh, in certain cases. And the way it's implemented under the hood is that they, they just happen to use uh, key value pairs where the key equals the value. So that's kind of nice. So just jumping into things. Um, so this, this is showing a function called conj. And the first thing you see in a list is that you have an open parentheses, and the first thing after that is the function. And everything after that is just arguments. Conj is a function that will add things to a list. It will add a new, new value, actually to a collection, and we'll talk about connect collections in a bit. Um, but in this case, we have a list, uh, one, two, three, and again, uh, just preface it with a, a single apostrophe so it doesn't get evaluated because it's just an argument. And then the number four. And so when we call conj on that, um, the new value will go to the front, and you see you end up with four, one, two, three. Now, if you choose to use a vector instead, it's just uh, square brackets, one, two, three. So conj, square brackets, one, two, three, and then four. And you see that the new value goes to the end. So that's one, two, three, four. And uh, also, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking uh, specifically yet about the REPL, but this is uh, the environment that you would actually execute these commands in. And I'll talk about that probably at the very end. But there's an interactive environment, I read an eval print loop that allows you to interactively query uh, um, what you're doing and, and get immediate results. And um, you're, you're able to put whatever you'd like in these lists, in these uh, vectors, and it, it can be heterogeneous. So for example, here what I'm doing is I'm being kind of tricky, uh, and my, just stand up for a second. <clears throat> this is actually notation for a vector. So even though this looks somewhat like a map, like a key, a value, key, a value, this is just a vector. So it's, it's a vector with heterogeneous things in it. So that's why I say it, it's just posing as a map. It's really just a vector, and, and we're just adding the four on. So that's why the four is going to go to the end. So is it a vector of a map and an element? Or? It's actually just a vector. It's a vector of a keyword followed by an integer with another keyword followed by another integer. And so on. Yeah. And at first I did that by accident, and I thought, I'll just leave it in there because it's kind of nice. So, and, and the result is you get this, this vector. Um, and notice that, and that you know it's a vector because there's an odd number of elements. You see uh, uh, there's the colon C, and then three, and then four. In the next line, uh, I show a true map. And so we have here, before I stand back up. Let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow or you know anything like that. So here we have this map here, which has A1, B2, C3, and we have this new map coming in here, D4, right? And because we're using conj, it's going to become part of this map. I should also say that some that commas are, are not needed. Sometimes they're used for readability, but they're kind of ignored. And the REPL will put them back in when it prints it back to you just to uh, just for clarity. <coughs> and then here's an example of a set. So a set is prefixed by pound sign, and then everything else looks, uh, it, it, I'm sorry, pound and then, and then uh, uh, curly brace. So again, this is just going to be a set of elements, and they, they can be a header, they can look different, for example, they're not all integers. And this will end up uh, this way. So all the unique elements are here. And if I had you know, two ones or three ones in there, it would still only show uh, one one. Actually, it would probably do an error, because uh, you're not allowed to have uh, uh, more than one one in the set. If you try to add a second one, it will error. I think I think it will. Yeah. Like, how come ordinary is different for the set? How come ordinary is different? I'm sorry. Yeah. Ordinary. So you. Oh yeah. Order. So yeah. So the or the ordering is internal. There are ordered sets, but I'm not using them here. Uh, oh. But yeah, the default is sort of you know optimized. So closure also takes a practical approach. 
in that uh, it leaves uh, certain choices up to uh, what's best for that particular data structure. So uh, for a set, um, it has some reason for, for sorting it that way, but for performance. So if you actually want to look at the type of things, you can. You can ask it, you know, what, what class is it or what type is it? And here I'm also being a little bit tricky, so bear with me for a second. This is uh, a single quote and then a list. So this is a list. And uh, integers followed by a keyword, followed by a you know, string of one character length. This is a vector. This is a map. This is a set. But if I ask what type it is, it'll tell me it's a closure.lang.persistent list. That's because it's a list. Now that's interesting. We knew it was a list. But the word persistent is kind of interesting. And I'll get back to that a little bit. Here is the same idea for a vector. So closure.lang persistent vector. And this is all, closure is actually all open source. So you can see that these are actually, if you go to GitHub and, and check it out, these are, these are actually Java classes uh, under the hood. And this is a set. <coughs> and this is the type it is. So it's a closure.lang persistent hash set. And then uh, this as well is, is a map. And you can see it's an array map. So what, is the, what does it mean by the name persistent? So it actually goes to an older definition of um, the word. It has nothing to do with databases. It has to do with that uh, in Clojure, uh, data is immutable. Once it's created, it cannot be changed, kind of like final in, in Java. And this has uh, great advantages, um, uh, which we'll talk about later for concurrency and so forth. So if you add a question, you get a random question back, basically. It would, except for there's there's some, some nice tricks that, that happen with it. They actually share structure, and I'll talk about that. Okay, so copyright. Yeah. So, th so things aren't copied. They're just written and then referenced. So, so um, and I think that might be the next slide. I'm just show yeah. So if things are immutable, then how can things ever change? Like one of the, the criticisms or whatever of functional programming is that, you know, if nothing can change, then maybe it's just, the box is just generating heat. Uh, it's not doing anything, but but in order to like accomplish something, you have to have, you know have to change something sometimes. So so new things can be created, um, but the underlying structure and memory is shared wherever possible, and only the connections change. And actually, under the hood, there's, there's actually a, quite a, a literature involved um, with 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 what happens under the hood. But there there are these these uh, hash trees under the under the hood that. Uh, sort of organize the data. So there's like a cell for um, the value, and then there's a cell for the uh, the, the address uh, to the next thing. And those things, once they're created, they just uh, point to something else, uh, along, and, and they'll rebalance along the way. And there's a whole science to it, and I'm not, not going to get into that too much here. Um, but I will show that uh, there is structural sharing. Uh, this is actually, so there's actually a, a great um, uh, video out there uh, from Phil Potter in the London Closures, uh, Closure Users Group. And here's a link to his, his talk. And this is just a screenshot from, from his talk. So he's defining a list called L. Start pointing again. And this is again list notation. So there's a, a list with three elements, uh, uh, colon A, colon B, colon C. And this is just, you know, you're at the REPL, it's just acknowledging that it, that it understood, okay, I have a, a list called L. And then he's going to define a list called LL, which is just going to conch onto this list L, uh, a new element called on X. And, okay, that's understood too. So if we look at LL, we see that uh, because it's a list, the X, uh, colon X went to the front. So we have colon X and then A, B, C. So there's two common functions in, in Clojure. One is called first, which will give you the first element of a collection, and there's another function called rest, which will give you everything but the first element. Kind of like card, so you know, Exactly, it's card Twitter, yeah, exactly. They, they updated the, the, the names to make them more clear, so car is first and Twitter is rest. Mm -hmm. So this is, for those who have this background, so if you take the rest of LL, um, you get ABC, which was everything but that uh, colon X. And there's also a function uh, enclosure that will return true only when the symbols are in fact the exact same object under the hood, and that's called identical with a question mark. One of the nice things about closure is you can actually have question marks in your function names because it's, it's legal. So, so the, what this is saying is that 
you know, okay, are these, are these, so it's going to compare arguments and say, are they identical? And the, the things we're going to compare are going to be the rest of LL and, and uh, just like any other. And that's really nice because uh, sometimes you want to change data structures on the fly, and you don't really need to change any of your code if you stay within these functions because if you're counting a, uh, elements in your vector or your map or your set, um, that count still understands how to evaluate that for each of those underlying data structures. Um, which is very nice. So this is just an example below in blue. From, so there's a, a closure.org is, is one of the uh, great websites that has a lot of information about closure, and they actually have a cheat sheet which organizes the, some of the functions uh, into concrete groups. And this is the part uh, that talks about collections. So you can see there's a function called count, there's a function called empty, non-empty, uh, into if you want to uh, put, uh, put something into a collection, and con we've already seen. And there's a lot of functions that you know do the things that you you expect to want to do, and a lot of them have been optimized, and it's very very nice. You can also do type tests. For example, is it a collection? It's called with a question mark. Is it a list? Is it a vector? Is it a set? And so on. Any questions? Just a question mark imply a boolean response. Um, by by convention, more than anything else, you can. You can create any you can create a new function yourself and you know make it all question marks and you, know, you can do whatever you like. But yes, the ones that are in uh, quoted by core, I think, uh, by default. They just they look like. Yeah, yeah. So there's also a concept of, of sequences, and uh, mm -hmm. there's there's a seek function that will ensure that you have a seek, and uh, these are also persistent and immutable. And we talked a little bit about laziness. Uh, the default is that you know these things won't necessarily realize until you explicitly ask for them, and that's really useful because say you're dealing with an infinite sequence, you can do that, you know, because you're not until you actually ask for all of that infinity, you're not going to get it. So uh, that's that's very useful, or very large data as well. Uh, and this is a, and there's also an underlying uh, seek interface. So um, at the Java level, under the hood, there, there is actually an interface that, that can be used. Um, um, I don't know if I, I don't, uh, just leave that for now. <laughs> uh, and this, so you can also, you can get a shorter seek from a longer seek, uh, you get by distinct, you get distinct elements, filter is very useful, and that will take actually a, a regular expression uh, and, and get your results. You can remove, uh, there's a for list comprehension, um, and you can also get a longer seek from a shorter seek, and those are some of the, uh, the functions. I don't want to go into too much detail there, but take, let's say take is also very useful. So if I want to take you know, 100 of the first elements of an infinite sequence, I can do that. So I would go take you know, 100 and so forth. And uh, probably one of the most useful uh, functions that I like is one called map, and we'll see that shortly. No, I sort of had that twice. Right? Here we see first again. Uh, okay. Oh, first, let's take another digression. So this is also another slide from one of uh, Stuart Holloway's talks. Uh, being home iconic is, is one of these properties that, that lists have, uh, home meaning the same and iconic being representation. And so they have this sort of uniform syntax where you have the first element after the open friend is the verb. And everything else is, is arguments. So uh, you can see that even uh, what, regardless of what you're doing, whether it's a function, an operator, a method call, uh, an import, and so forth, you're still following that, that same convention, which is really quite elegant and beautiful. Um, and in a sense, you know, if you view the parentheses as, as a list, uh, the language itself is a list. So there's this, there's this idea of uh, of data as code and code as data, depending on your perspective. So <coughs> we've been looking at, 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 at functions being the, the first uh, element after the parentheses, and here's an example of map uh, taking another function that I'm defining on the fly. And there's, there's two ways to do that, and I'll sort of go through this. I don't want to like, scare anybody, but so from here to here is actually uh, an anonymous function definition. And all it's doing is saying. Is that a lambda? Yes. yes. <coughs> and I want to 
go too far into that, but um, but suffice it to say, you're, it, there's going to be some collection here that's going to feed in piecemeal each element, which is going to be here. And here we're just going to use this function called print line, and that's just going to print it out. And then this is going to map over that entire collection. And it's just convention, I guess, in lists and in closure as well, that rather than putting the parentheses on, on a, this parentheses matches this one, this one matches this one, this one matches uh, this one. So, so this is what that's doing. It's range is a, is a function that goes from 1 to 9 um, uh, because of the arguments I gave it. I think it would start at 0 if I just gave it you know, range 10, it would go from 0 to 9. Anyway, and so this is what it prints out. What is new? Nil is just nothing. I think that's an artifact of because I'm using it. It, it also has to. Um, so the last thing that a uh, function does is it returns the value, and so I, I I'm just calling this this function, but it's returning nothing. If I had the x there, then you know, so there are nine nils. Yeah, yeah, for each one. Yeah. There are nine nils. Yeah. So. So now, now can closure do that in parallel? Same if you have a filter function, you are finding your collection while running everything on different forms. So, so this one, not not the way it's written here, mm -hmm. but there's actually also a pmap, which is a parallel map that you can use. Uh, there's also other things that we'll talk about uh, a bit later that discuss uh, the concurrency and, and parallelism. Um, and here, what all I'm showing is that there's this. So I've used this anonymous function notation using an fn, um, but you can also do the same thing with a shorthand notation. And because there are uh, <coughs> macros in lists, I think that, that this is probably a macro. I should probably check on that. But this this notation here, a pound sign and then open uh, print, then this being the first argument, the parentheses, is exactly the same thing. So if I call a function called equals, and I ask, you know, is this exactly the same as this? It returns true. So that's just a, two ways of, of doing the same thing. So there's a lot of flexibility in, in, in the expressiveness. Where we can see that actually. Yeah. All right, so it's very common for people to ask uh, people to uh, solve this FizzBuzz pro problem, where you have, uh, you're asked to print the numbers from 1 to n, where n can be. 100 or 20 or whatever it might be, and if a number is divisible by 3, you're to print fizz instead of just printing the number, and if it's divisible by 5, you print buzz instead of the number, and if the number is divisible by 3 and 5, you print fizz buzz. So how do you go about doing this in a, in a functional way? Uh, in, a, in a parallel language, you probably have a loop of some kind, and you, you test these conditions. Uh, well, so this is an, uh, the idea is just to show how this would be done in a functional language. So, functional language is a little bit different. There is no loop per se. You're not iterating. There's nothing that's there's no counter that's that's going up or down. You have a map function, and again, we've seen range before. So range, I, I'm just only going to 25. So for, for the numbers one to 25, what it's going to do is it's going to apply this anonymous function, which goes from here all the way to here. And what we're going to do is first off. We're gonna, our function here is a multiplication. So we're going to multiply it 3 times 5, and that's 15. And then, um, just for clarity, I, I, I put percent 1. I, I couldn't just put percent. Um, but you're, in, your, in this anonymous function syntax, you can also have several arguments that come in, percent 1, percent 2, et cetera, in a, in a prolish sense. So I just wanted to show that. So is con basically a switch statement? So you con is, yeah, condition. Okay. Yeah. So, um, what we have here is we have a condition for the first test. So what this is going to do is this is going to value 15, and it's going to say mod of the argument coming in up from, from this, which will be 1 first. Uh, so, so 1 mod 15, is that equal to 0? And it will say <coughs> yes or no, true or false. And if it is true, then this will result. It will print that out. So in the first case, it's not true. In the second case, it's not true. In the, thick, in the, in the third case, um, we have 3, right? So 3 mod 3 is 0, so 0 will return true and you'll get this. So that's what we get this. And then here, the same thing for, for buzz, now we're just divided by 5. So we're, the module is 5. So 
I, I guess the reason why I did percent one is that in, in some languages percent is mod, so I didn't want to be confusing mm -hmm. in that sense, but maybe I'm more confused. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, the test here is mod of whatever is coming in uh, five, and then um, is that equal to zero? And then there's the else case, right? And else just just return whatever came in, and that's why you see the numbers for the ones that don't match. So that, that's how that would be done in uh, a functional. And that's strict ordering then. In, uh, in yeah, the it's, it's, it's the it's the whatever it's the questions of the the test you're doing on construct. It's it's the first match. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And um, I should also mention there are also uh, matching libraries in Clojure that are doing some some fancy things, but this is not. This is just straight. Uh, um, this is just a function con. Now, because uh, now the way I've written it, this is is all you know taking up a lot of space. But I could very well have another function that I separate out that looks like this, and then just call that function and put it here, and then it would be very succinct to terse. Would you call it here? <laughs> on something else here, yeah. You could. <laughs> Sorry, my brain. <laughs> so, I don't want to get too far into the S expressions because it's a complicated, uh, it, I, I find it difficult to, to, uh, to explain. But there are symbolic expressions, and uh, there's this quote from uh, a great book, The Joy of Closure, I think it's one of the uh, great books in the closure community. And it's from Alfred North Whitehead, who is great to read anyways, and it says it requires a very unusual mind to undertake an analysis of the obvious. And, and it, it's kind of true. It's like when, when you do that, you actually see things that seem obvious later. But a lot of things that we, we think are simple are simple because somebody worked hard to make it simple. And uh, I think that that's the beauty of things. And sometimes you, you see the answer, and you're, oh, that's easy. But it was a problem before that you really should look at first. So uh, I'm not an expert on this topic, but my understanding is that John McCarthy, who invented Lyft, uh, had a great deal of, of insight and wisdom uh, about this. And it's basically a, a, a part of mathematical logic that allows you to assign symbolic names to, to, to data. And you have trees of expressions, uh, each of which returns a value. So that's really nice, because you can take a huge chunk of code, trees of expressions, and you can say, OK, that's going to be 3 or 41 or whatever value that is. And now you can, you can lean on that number and sort of you know, see how you understand the problem going forward. So uh, that, that's a very effective way to simplify things. And, uh, and not only data can be assigned to bars, but, but functions as well, functions are first class. And um, the way you do that in closure is with def uh, to define something, fn as we've seen for anonymous function syntax. But you can also use defn, which is to define a function, which is just a combination of def and fn together. So if I want to define a function, I can do it in one blow. OK, so another feature of, of, of lists are macros. So macros are just things that write code. So why would you want code that writes code? And that could go on indefinitely, right? So some of the, some of the reasons are you, you really want to uh, arrange the code differently. Uh, I'll, I'll show a little bit later, but there are some uh, threading macros enclosure with uh, so dash uh, greater than and, and dash greater than greater than, which are just a way of reordering uh, the way um, uh, the language is set up. So we, what we've seen so far is that we have the, the open parentheses, and the first thing is the function, and everything else is args. Well, if you didn't like the fact that if you want to add two numbers, you'd have to go open paren plus one two close paren. That would give you three. You could actually um, write a macro that would allow you to put pluses between the numbers. And that's the power that macro, macros give you. It allows you to create things that allow you to think in the domain space of the problem at hand, rather than the, uh, the mechanics of the language that you find yourself in. So it's a way to create a DSL? You can use it to create domain-specific languages, absolutely. <laughs> and that, that's a good use case in, in many cases. There's also been some kind of separate discussion about that, because um, one thing you, you do have to be aware of is that if you, uh, this is also this, this concept of functional programming called compose, composition, composability. Mm -hmm. So if you have functions, you can compose functions together. I can use something that, that, uh, that adds and then multiplies and then adds and multiplies, and I can compose them uh, in a uh, pretty straightforward manner. 
But if I use a macro at some point, the macro is usually at, at the last part of that. So if you want to add, if somebody's written a DSL with macros, mm -hmm. and you have something that happens after that, mm -hmm. uh, you have to be careful because you know um, that you might lose some 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 composability. Mm -hmm. But that's uh, yeah, topic for another time. <laughs> There's, there's also this. Uh, there's also two uh, nice macros for Java interop. We'll talk about Java interop a little bit later. This is sort of like the grand tour. Uh, one is called the dot macro. I just wrote dot, but it's actually with a, with a period, with a, so dot, and then dot not macro. And uh, they really serve to reduce or, or remove boilerplate code that you find in some JVM language. So uh, I don't know why I included this. Actually, we could probably just skip over or just talk about it briefly. So Paul Graham wrote about. Uh, why what made list different, and some of it actually applies to closure as well. Um, essentially, the whole language is always available. There's no real distinction between read time, compile time, and run time. You can compile or run code while reading, read or run code while compiling, and read or compile code at runtime. So um, I think I'll leave it at that. But essentially, you have the flexibility. You're at you're at this REPL that we'll we'll talk about, where you can actually interact. See the results of, of functions that you're um, uh, that you're, you're you're sending off for evaluation, and uh, you have a lot of flexibility there. So I, I thought I'd put this in as well. So Closure compiles all of the code you load on the fly into JVM bytecode, but sometimes you also uh, it might be advantageous to compile it ahead of time. And one of the reasons for this is, say, you want to use a Java library uh, in, and access it from your your Closure code. Um, uh, sometimes, uh, or, or the reverse, sometimes you want to actually generate class files for your, your closure. All right, so let's look at some, some code and code as data. So I, I just um, put together a quick mock uh, data set here. So I define this thing, this symbol called jazz tunes, and it's going to be a vector of maps where, kind of like what, what um, you, you were showing before with your data. Uh, each map is a row, and here there happen to be four rows. And the fields that would go into a database, for example, <coughs> your title, uh, artist, and album, and they're all keywords. So this is a nice way to, to sort of separate and and, uh, and and show what are the keys, what are the values. So these are just some common jazz songs. And um, what I'm showing here is that we can use the map function. And so keywords actually evaluate themselves, but they'll also pull out, they'll act as functions and pull out uh, that particular key from the, um, the collection as well. So if I map this, so if I just, if, if, if I just call um, uh, colon artist on jazz tunes, it would, it, I'm sorry, on, on one, one map, one of these maps, it would, it would bring me the value of, of that particular map. In this case, I'm using the map function to apply this function over all the collection of jazz tunes. So that's going to give me Oscar Peterson, which came from here, uh, John Coltrane, which came from here, and it's, it's in the order that I saw it as well. Is that, is that, is that okay? Can everybody see that? Is that? Am I going too slow, too fast? Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Here I'm also showing um, um, working on data using a, a function called group on. And again, it's the same idea. Instead of map, we're just going to group by, and then this is our function, and this, this is our collection. And what it's, what it's done, it, it's brought out the, the artist and, and put it up here, and then the remainder of each object is, is there, it gets each map, and so forth. So, oh, so, this, so this, the main idea is that, you know, this is data, but it's, it's in a vector of maps, which is code. So you have that fluidity between um, code as data and, and, and data as, as, as code. All right, so now I'm showing um, this idea of a um, um, threading macro. So before I was showing things that would be kind of like this syntax, where you have a friend and you have a function, and then and there's and something going on, but there's no argument here. What's actually happening? So this is a, a threading macro, which is going to take things instead of like inside out. This is going to go. Okay, this is the first thing, and then here's the, the next thing that happens, and then here's the next thing that happens. And uh, because there's two uh, greater than's here, what, what's actually going to happen is it's, it's going to use the uh, uh, insertion of the argument as the second 
as the second argument rather than the first argument. So we're going to start out with that data structure now, and it's going to call the sort by function with this uh, bringing out the, the album. And then this would all go in one line. So to, to avoid that, make it nice and pretty, there's a pretty print function that should be casual like that, but a, a vector of mass. What if I also had um, some likes where I had like a vector of mass, but here we had each artist, and then I don't know, I may have some numbers for, for likes. And suppose that we wanted to take those two things and join them together, merge them together, so that we have, you know, title, artist, album, and likes all together. So there's this function called merge, uh, that the way it's written, you actually have to map, and use, and use merge as a, as a higher order function, and then map onto the likes and ingest. So what we end up is exactly what we wanted, uh, our artist, our likes, title, album, and then our, our next set, and so forth. So how does it know that you match on artist? Because artist is both well likes. Uh, because we sorted or something. Yeah, um, that's a good question. How did I have to rethink what I was doing? Is it because artist no. is likes and artist is also the Yeah, that's Also yeah. common, common. <coughs> yes, on, on a key, common key. Yeah, right. Okay, common keys, right? Exactly. Um, the so sort. A magic merge gets, looks different if you have to do multiple keys or something. Yeah, and there's also a function called merge with that gives you a little more flexibility. Um, <coughs> so if you just use merge straight up, this is what you end up with. And, and this sort of illustrates the utility of, of mapping and higher order functions. So if you just use merge on its own, what you end up is the, the, the first uh, map, the second map, uh, these are all the likes, and then followed by. Um, the jazz tune uh, data structure. So high order functions allow great flexibility in reshaping data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is also something I want to play around with more because it's actually very powerful. So let me write along. <clears throat> so uh, the third point it was to be symbolized with an established platform. Now there is inter interop, uh, Java interop as a built-in syntax. And it's, it's quite easy to use Java libraries uh, from Clojure, and it's also easy to use um, Clojure from Java, uh, which is quite useful. And with this, when, when, I guess one of the things when, when the language was created, one of the worries were is, you know, now we have another language, and the, the biggest thing with a new language is there's nothing you can do with it because you need libraries to be able to actually accomplish your doing real work. So this is a way to get around that. Java had been around for 15 years, and that was great library. So if you want to use Hadoop, if you want to use anything from the Apache Foundation, anything in a Maven repo, uh, it's all available. So let's talk a little bit about Java and Interop. And by the way, each of these, these sort of topics are um, probably talks in and of their, their own for, for an hour's length. So I'm probably doing great injustice by, by doing it this way, but at least you get like a flavor of, of, of the language what you can do. So um, in Java, if you have a constructor, you use new and you know some some name of your class and then some argument. In Clojure, um, th there's multiple ways to do this. There's also a new, but what I'm showing here is just the simplest way. If you notice this period here, so we had to use the same syntax as before. This is the class name, and then dot, and then here the everything here will be arguments. So there's more arguments that go this way, and that's that's going to construct uh, an object. Um, if you have, if you want to call a method. Um, and your method is called next int, then you put the dot here. And this is all like the power of macros to put together this nice uh, uniform syntax. Um, if you want to chain functions, uh, like you would in, notice there's actually more parentheses in the Java version than the uh, Clojure version because of this dot dot macro that allows um, all the nasty parentheses to go away. You could also do it this way using the method syntax where you'd say, okay, give me a person with the, the constructor, right? And then get address of that person and then get the zip code. You can do it that way. But there's this nice uh, dot dot macro, which uh, avoids that. And then if you want to access static uh, members, you can do it this way with a slash, so map slash pi, or you know, system get properties with that. And then, uh, of course, I'm going through this way too fast, but there's also things that you can use to do to an object and then do, do more to that object and keep continuing on. So there's a do to macro. So for example, if I want to do something to a hash map, 
and I want to first add you know, a key and a value, and then another key and a value, I can use this do to, which ends here. And then here's another um, example where you can import something from uh, Swing, uh, JPanel to JPanel, and you, know, you have your do to, your, your constructor for the JPrame, it's going to say here I am, and uh, there's also a, a function called proxy that's very useful, I'm not going to go into that right now. But essentially, if you run this, you'll actually get the, um, the frame coming out and saying, here I am. So what's nice is that um, it's not only the J JVM now that is within the reach of, of, of this closure way of, of expressing uh, uh, code. Uh, it, it's been on the, on the .NET platform as well for, for a little while. And now there's this thing called ClojureScript, which compiles down to JavaScript, which is getting a lot of traction as well. And uh, so it's going to be very interesting. And that, now they all take a practical approach. So there's a common core of, of a language that is available in, in each of these. Mm -hmm. But there are certainly uh, uh, edge cases with, which are only implemented in a particular host. And lastly, uh, designed for concurrency. Uh, I had to put this in. I don't usually share a state when I do. So the way, um, so everything is, is immutable in terms of data, but if you don't want immutable data, then you have to explicitly use uh, specific functions and specific symbols uh, uh, that, that indicate you want to share immutable state. And, and that's one of the things, and there's also just native support for, for certain types of concurrency, which makes it easier to go about. Um, just a, a few uh, definitions. So there's a concept of being asynchronous, where we're the request to update is queued to happen in another thread sometime later, and the thread that made the request can continue immediately. There's also a concept of being coordinated, uh, where reads and writes to multiple reps uh, can be made in a way that guarantees no race conditions. And then retrial just means that it's speculative and you may have to retry. And this is different than parallelism. Parallelism is, is taking a task and dividing and conquering, sort of like splitting it up into multiple parts that each may run at the same time. Uh, concurrency is the execution of disparate tasks that at roughly the same time and share a common resource. So this is actually the, sh the sharing of, of information. So there's, there's three basic um, uh, with, uh, vehicles to, to do this. One is called a ref, another is called an agent, another is called an atom. And uh, they all are, uh, they, they all will share uh, state, um, but they all have different trade-offs. And uh, for example, a, a ref is not asynchronous; it's coordinated, and it will and it can retry. Uh, whereas an agent uh, is asynchronous, and you just you just, you just start it off, uh, as opposed to an atom that uh, is not asynchronous, uh, but it's not coordinated either. So, I'm also going to do a lot of hand waving, but there's there's something here. Essentially, transactions are supported in closure so that uh, if you use a ref, uh, there's something called software transactional memory, where you, you, if you if you wrap that that ref's uh, meat of what it's doing in, in a transaction, um, it, it will it will do its work and it will try to complete that work and then um, it, it sort of like isolates exactly all that work in one one area, um, and the STM uses multi-version. Uh, concurrency control, which is a huge topic in and of itself. And essentially what it's doing is it, it's going to mark the old data as obsolete and adds the newer, the, as it adds the newer version. So you'll have a history of, of sorts uh, as the changes have been made, and there's ways to, to query that, I think. So refs are part of this, this, um, this transaction framework. They're mutable references to objects. Uh, can only be changed within a transaction and if you wrap it in do sync. Uh, there's no locks, so there's no chance of a deadlock, and this multi-version concurrency control ensures uh, what they call snapshot isolation, where each transaction gets its own view of the data it's interested in. So, so each transaction is oblivious to uh, other transactions, um, and, but um, a, a ref's modification will, will either succeed or it won't. So like, for example, if, if a second transaction commits a change while the first one is still working, it may cause the first transaction to, to retry. So you might have to wait for that. And then this is very small, but this sort of shows um, 
using different data what, what reps look like. So here I'm just going to define something called, I'm going to call it my rep just to make it clear. Rep is just a function. So I'm going to call rep, and this is going to be a rep, and this is just a map. And I decided that I was going to do furniture at the time. So the type of furniture, the color, length, width, and height. So we start out with a coffee table. And the thing about um, uh, these, these uh, ways of expressing usable state is you can dereference them using deref, and that will actually show you uh, what's inside of it. Or you can use this syntactic sugar, which is this at sign. So if I go at my ref, I'll get the same thing as if I call deref. That's coffee table here. So uh, another thing I didn't show, but there's a um, function called a, a asoc or associ for associate something with something else. So this is going to associate uh, the dereference value of my ref with um, uh, the keyword being furniture and a bench, not a coffee table. And you can see the result is that coffee table was replaced by bench. Now, this is still immutable, right? This is not an assigned type of thing. It's just the output of this function here. So if I dereference my ref, you can see that it's still a coffee table. Now, one way to change values um, is by calling this function commute. So if I call commute uh, on my ref, which is one up here, and associate uh, that with uh, furniture being bench, we're going to get an error. And the reason why is because we didn't wrap this in a transaction. Um, it has to be within a do sync. So here it is with a do sync, the do sync commute, and so forth, and now we have bench. So if we do reference my, my ref, now we have our status changed. It's being stated to bench. And uh, there are different functions you can use for refs, but commute is just one that will give you uh, an enhanced uh, level of concurrency than the ref set because uh, if you use it on things that are able to be um, uh, that are commutative, like, like addition or, or, or um, multiplication, uh, it can make some optimizations. So here are some uh, other uh, functions that can be used with refs, and I encourage you know just look at it later. <laughs> but you can actually get a history count. Uh, you can set validators. There's a bunch of things you can do. Uh, An atom looks very very similar. Um, instead of uh, my ref, now it's called my atom. But that I could have very well just had one name for the type thing. The only thing that I want to change would have been from ref to atom. So that's also very convenient. You can uh, try different things. You do reference it the same way. Uh, but it does have its own syntax for, for making changes, and it doesn't need to be in a transaction because of the nature of atoms. So in this case, you use swap, and, and that's, that's what happens here. So depending on the nature of the problem, you, you use that table I showed earlier about you know whether you want um, uh, it to be synchronous or asynchronous, or uh, uh, that they're all shared uh, and coordinated or uncoordinated. So I skipped over agents. I guess I thought I had one agency, but I don't. So let's just talk about tooling for, for a second. So we talked about you know the fact that you can use libraries from from the Java world, from Closure world, and it, it's becoming amazing how much there is available right now, um, and it's growing rapidly. Um, we'll show a little bit of the the REPL, the read eval print loop that we've been showing sort of those snapshots from that slides from. But that's essentially how you evaluate your code. There's also, also this great tool that most of the Closure community uses called Linegen, which is kind of your build tool. And I'll show a little bit about that. Essentially, uh, you, you have this file that Linegen produces called a project.clish. And by the way, all the, uh, the, the file extension for Closure is .clish. So uh, project.clish is actually looked like a data structure. Um, it's actually a death project. And I'll show an example of that. And you can add dependencies there. Um, and you, there's, you don't really need an IDE, but you can, of course, use any IDE you'd like, and there's many choices, and there's lots of support. So libraries, there's a site called closurearch.org, which is like a play, identical to like Maven, where they use the same syntax, actually. So you, you can, you, you're going to have uh, a group ID, an artifact ID, and a version, and that information uh, gets put into the project.glitch. Um, there's a number of great libraries out there if you want to just uh, start a quick website, you can use Ring or Noir. Um, also, if you want to generate HTML, or uh, you, uh, there's a great library called Hiccup. Enlive is a, 
the kind of uh, templating library for HTML, which will use um, CSS selector syntax. All these are probably the top 10 in themselves. Uh, if you want to use Hadoop for data processing, you can map reduce. There's a uh, great library called Cascalog, which is based on the uh, Java client cascading and, um, and, and, and uses a, a data log style um, language on top of that. For statistics, there's an R-like library called Encanter. Uh, and then if you want to make your, your query calls to your database, your SQL, more composable, pretty often what happens is when you write queries to a database, you get this long, huge query, and you just deal with it atomically. Uh, but at some level, it's nice to have, you know, well, this does one thing, this does another thing, and make it more, more proposable and more, more functional. So these are uh, efforts to, to, that, to that extent. So what these things will do is you, you, uh, you write functions that will emit pieces of, of SQL. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's two efforts for that, Quorum, Quorum and Closure QL. Probably a good time for my, my big question. Sure. Um, what kind of problems would you use Closure, and what kind of problems would you not use Closure? Okay. Fair enough. Uh, can I talk about a little bit? I'll, I'll have some yeah. examples coming, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then these are some other, other questions. So for example, this is, I'm going to show an example of Docger is actually a, a library that uses the Apache uh, uh, Java library to uh, read Microsoft Office documents. So these are kind of you know, binary files. How are you going to open up and look at them? So you install Line again, and, and the executable is called Line. L I, I'm sorry, L E I N, and you just go line new, and then some name. I called it clidge-xl, and it's going to create a directory called uh, clidge-xl, and I can cd into that directory, and it's going to actually give a give a tree, a high, uh, I'm sorry, a directory full of full of files uh, mm -hmm. and structure, and one of the files there is going to be called project.clidge, and uh, it looks very much, it's very much like code of data. Uh, you have a dev project, and then the name you gave it. And uh, I think it usually says 0.1.0 dash snapshot. I always change it because it's like, you know, uh, you're already at 0 0.1. Anyway. But you can write a description and, and URL and metadata around that, license, whatever. The, the only change I've made here is where it says plugins. I've added that. And I'm using um, a dependency called Lean Swing, Line Swing, which is going to allow me to use, uh, to connect to the Rebel from Emacs. And at the dependencies, I'm going to use uh, Clojure version 1.4 and this Docsure library that I got from uh, looking at Clojure. So I don't know if you can see this, but this is, you just take this and you know, use that. And then you go line dex for, uh, to go get the dependencies, and then line REPL. So here I'm showing line REPL, and I guess that's hard to see. But uh, it starts up uh, an NREPL server, it tells you what port it's on, so you can actually connect to it as well from other things, like your IDE, for example. And it gives you some commands. So here I just ran print line uh, hello world, and it tells me hello world, and then nil is in return. So in this case, say we have an Excel file, and this is just a sample. Uh, it's an Excel format. I haven't been opening up in LibreOffice, but it actually was created in, in Microsoft Excel. Um, and this is the way it looks like. So there's a bunch of fake data. And you know it's a binary file, so let's read it. So <clears throat> it actually turns out, when you're done, uh, to be very little code. But the creating of this code takes a while to do. Uh, but it's very elegant. So this is the, your namespace. It's uh, Clidge as Excel is the name that I gave uh, the project. And dot .core is just by, by default what it's called. It's called core.clidge. It's a file underneath. It's going to use uh, this preprint uh, library just to uh, print these uh, nicely, so they're not all in one line. And I'm going to require this, um, this uh, doctor uh, library, and I'm going to um, call it addbacks, so I can just refer to it as X. It's a long name. And then I just create this one function here, which is going to take in um, the file name. And so what's happening here is this is the threading macro. It's taking the name of the file as a string. Then it's calling uh, load workbook from, from this library, and which is going to give, give it a, I don't know, a workbook object of stuff. And then from that workbook object, it's going to get, it's going to convert that to a, a, a seat of sheets. So these are going to be sheet objects now. And we'll just grab the first one, we'll call that sheet one, because 
our, our data only had one sheet. And then, um, just because of the, the semantics of, of the way things work, these were all uh, single thread macros because we wanted the, the argument to be the first one. And it, it just so happened that, that the way this is written, it used the second one. So that's why we use the double thread macro. Um, essentially, what we're doing is um, we're going to create a new. Uh, <coughs> we have these objects, and we're, we're essentially going to remove empty rows. And we have these we have, we have these cells, and uh, we're going to omit the um, just just the data because there's, it just so happens that there's a lot of objects that get created by the way that the Apache library is written, and uh, this is just a way to to um, to, to, to get to the, the the rows. And what we end up with then is is, is a C, and uh, it's lazy, so I won't actually evaluate unless I put this new C here. So that what this will do is it will go through the rows collection row. And then these are objects, so we have to map on the uh, read cell. And this is a little bit complicated, but just to, just to show the idea, this is the output that we, we can get. So we see that everything came out as a list, and this is our data. So this is an example of something that you, know, you could do in very few lines once you are familiar. And, uh, I don't know. Any questions? I don't know if that's a good example, but this is, this is something that I guess the key thing with that is when, when I mistype sh sheet sequence or something like that, and you know, it's how am I knowing that I, you know, where and how I botched it and seeing what the intermediates are there. Absolutely. So you would actually develop this at the REPL, and I, I can show that a little bit at the end if you want, but you, you, you write it, it, you send the line directly, and then you get immediate feedback. Yeah. So it actually like sees one of the sheets or something like that. You would probably see that it's a it's an object of type whatever and from some Java library, and then you'd be like, oh, okay, I need to look go look up what method, you know. Yeah. If you is it at the point where it's sort of like auto completing or giving you in terms of the IDEs that are available? Absolutely, yeah. There are, there are IDEs that do that. Yeah. So they're talking your IDEs and It's not reversed. <laughs> well, hopefully, it's like the next logical conclusion from the previous slide. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of old school on that. I just like syntax highlighting. But, um, but there are uh, IDs that will do much more. And your favorite Java ID will probably has a, a closure plugin. And it depends on what, what everybody uses. So what, what do people use? So there's actually a survey that goes out uh, once a year. Um, and this survey was actually uh, announced on Twitter and the closure mailing list, which has like 5,700 recipients. And it, within seven days, they got 3,372 responses. And this is the breakdown of what people were using. So you can see it's very heavy Emacs, but you can see IntelliJ is there, NetBeans is there, um, VI as well, Eclipse plus counterclockwise. I think if you, if you use Eclipse, Eclipse with counterclockwise I've used is quite good actually. Um, but I think that you know this will only uh, increase. Um, but I think that you know it's also a, a different mentality because uh, in some sense. Um, if, if somebody relies heavily on ID, you know what language they use, um, and the reverse is true too. So I think people that that, that use closure, they, they like to have syntax highlighting and things like that, but they don't. It's not such an important thing uh, as it is uh, if you use Java. And um, one other, another question that was asked was, what would have been the biggest wins for you in using closure? And so this is sort of like an, a, a listing of what people have responded. Whether it's uh, functional programming, the REPL, um, immutability, concurrency, facility, that's sort of an idea of like, what people have answered. And that was the whirlwind grand tour. <laughs> but it wasn't too long. I can show you some, some REPL stuff if you like as well. And that's it. Thank you.